start by asking you all a question that I'd like you to reflect on. Why are you here today? So there's probably some proximate reasons you're here. You're here because you know it's required for a class maybe, or you're interested in this particular topic, but I wanna ask you to dig a little bit deeper than that. Why are you studying what you're studying? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you interested in this topic more generally? And my guess is that for a lot of us, it's the reason that you're here is related to the fact that these pictures that I'm showing you make you feel good. They remind you to take a deep breath, they calm you down. If you're like a lot of people, they make you, they make you a little more cognitively sharp, sharp like a cactus. So the reason might be because ecosystems enrich our, enrich our lives and they increase our well-being in many, many ways. That's probably the reason that a lot of us are here. This is sort of central to being human, at least a lot, a lot, the way a lot of us may think about it. One of the primary ways that they enrich our lives and increase our well-being is through non-material benefits or cultural ecosystem services. So this is what I focus on, one of the things that I focus on in my research and what I'll be talking to you about today. What are non-material benefits, cultural ecosystem services, and how can we study them in a meaningful way? So I'm assuming most of you are familiar. How many of you have heard of the concept of ecosystem services? Okay, so pretty much everybody. So the idea is that ecosystem processes are improving human well-being. That's the important connection here. And the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005 did this global assessment of what's going on with ecosystems and their connections to well-being. And it came up with a three-part framework, which I know many of you know uh, about, uh, three cate main categories of ecosystem services. The provisioning, food and fiber, regulating, things like climate regulation and water purification, and then this third category, this is a little bit the, the, the wild child of ecosystem services, right? So this is the category that I study, obviously, and I think the, the way that I like to think about it, as I, in the slide before said, is that these are, these are the non-material benefits. So culture is a bit of a crazy word, a bit of a complicated word, but if we think about these as the, the non-physical things, they're harder to measure with an instrument. There's not necessarily an instrument that measures these things, that me measures spiritual value or identity or heritage value. That's what I focus on. So this is a list of most of the categories of cultural services that have been discussed in the current literature. So I'll give you a second to look through those. When we talk about cultural services, this is mostly what we talk about. And what I wanna mention quickly is that Non-material factors are critical to well-being. So one of the projects that I've done is looked at different typologies of human well-being. How do people think about what it means to be well as a human? And there are categories within those typologies, there are, there are different kinds of well-being. All of them have non-material components. In many of them, the non-material components outnumber the material components of well-being. So these are things like affection, having, having affection, having social connection, having the ability to play, having the ability to experience beauty. These are parts of what make us human and what make us be well. And the question with cultural ecosystem services or what, I, what we're looking at here is how are ecosystems connected to those non-material factors? So you can sort of think about the, the services side being non-material and hard to measure. And then the, on the recipient side, that what we're benefiting, the parts of well-being that we're benefiting often are also non-material. So this is ecosystem services in theory. There are these three categories. We work on these three categories. We try to incorporate them in decision making. I would argue that this is what they look like in practice. We talk about cultural services and ecosystem services work incorporates cultural services much less. My argument is that, and my experience is that the reason for this is that we don't know how to measure these. So the title of the talk is how do you measure that? because that is the most common question that I get in my work. Yes, that's really important, that's really great, I feel this, but how do you measure that? So I'm happy to talk in, in questions about the sort of larger societal situation that we're in that leads us to think that measurement is what we need, right? So there's that, that issue of, of what does measurement mean and, and, and why are we so focused on measurement? But I also think it's important to think about this is, this is the structure that we're in. How can we represent these values in this decision-making structure in a way that brings them onto the table. So that's really what my work is doing. 
there it, this is happening at a global scale. So how many of you have heard of IFBET, the, this intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services? One person. OK, a couple people. Um, OK, so this is a global initiative. It's similar to, has even a similar acronym to the <coughs> IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The idea is to bring nations together, representatives from nations together, to understand what's going on with biodiversity and ecosystem services and how we should respond. So I've been lucky enough to be part of the conversations on the social science side of this panel related to cultural services, related to how are we going to uh, it, deal with the fact that when we talk about ecosystem services, there's this social, there's these non-material benefits. We need to figure out how to bring them into discussions. So I see this field as being at an exciting sort of nexus because there's a lot of compelling evidence, some of which I will share with you today, that these values are really important, really critical to well-being. There are also a lot of questions that remain. It's a really ripe research field. So I'll start, sort of try to use this framework today and present some compelling evidence for you, what I hope is compelling. To me, it's compelling. And then bring up what are the, the current research questions? What are we still looking at? What do we still need to know? So I want to take just a moment and, and get you warmed up thinking about what cultural services are. So I'm going to ask that you take just about one minute. And with the person next to you, I want you to share two different kinds of cultural services. One that's important to you. So think about from that list, what is something that's important to you that's a cultural ecosystem service? And then think about one that might be important to someone who's totally different than you. And you can think about any axis of difference, any kind of difference that comes to mind. Someone who's very different from you, what's a cultural service that might be important to them that maybe isn't as important to you? So go ahead and take just a cup, just one minute and share that, please. Thank you. was to first to get you to personalize this and to think about what does this mean in my life, right? Which I sort of started with at the beginning as well. The point of the second bullet was to sort of introduce the, the, what, something that's really central to me in this world of cultural ecosystem services, and that is ethical considerations. So one of my main motivations, if not my main motivation for doing this work, is because I think it has really important ethical implications. And I'm going to sort of run through those. So this question of who decides, for a lot of you, I've heard this in my discussions today, that I know that this is, a, this is part of your conversations here in this school. When you're making natural resources decisions, the questions of who is making the decisions, who has the power, is, is critical. We have to think about that. And so even using this framework of ecosystem services, that's an ethical choice. That's, that's, that's an ethical act. And I think this, in adding in this element of cultural ecosystem services is giving voice to a part, uh, to a way of thinking about ecosystems that's very different than the sort of dominant ecosystem services paradigm. And I think that if we're going to use it, understanding these cultural services is pretty, pretty critical. This is very related to the question of whose voices. So not only who's in the decision making role, who's deciding to use this framework, who's making the final decisions, but whose voices are being included. So this is looking at participatory methods and, and e even farther back than participatory methods, just who are we including and in when we think about these cultural services. So my big motivation here is that I would argue that these non-material benefits and non-material values get woven into decisions all the time, but that happens implicitly when these values aren't talked about in a rigorous, explicit way. And if those values get woven in implicitly, it means that the people with power, often money, are going to have their values woven into decisions. So my, one of my motivations is to make sure that we're representing a diversity of values, especially those maybe who, with people who, of people who don't have political power, so that we are ha have all, val all the values on the table, so that they're not being woven in as implicitly, but we can be more explicit about the fact that values are informing the decisions that we're making. So that's a big way that I frame why this is important to me. And related again to this is the question of whose and what kinds of values what kinds of representations of value are we using? So this is an economist cover now from about 10 years ago when this big ecosystem services debate was just coming out. And it was this 
idea that ecosystem services are very connected with monetizing. That there is sort of a synonymous relationship between monetization and ecosystem services. And I'm gonna argue that that's not, that's not always the case. It's often a relationship that holds, but it's not always the case. And what I'm interested in is that when we make decisions about how we're representing value, we're also making decisions about what kinds of value we can represent, if that makes sense. So if we decide to quantify, and then further down the line, if we have figured out how to quantify, if we decide to monetize, we're deciding which kinds of values we can include in that conversation. There are certain kinds of values, perhaps, and some of them I will talk about, that might be really difficult to put a number on and particularly a dollar value on. But does that necessarily mean they shouldn't be part of this conversation? So that's the ethical piece that I'm just gonna sort of situate what I'll talk about for the rest of today in. So my point here is that this concept of ecosystem processes benefiting well-being does not require a dollar value. And this is a big conversation in the cultural ecosystem services world. When and in what circumstances does monetization make sense? Does putting a dollar value make sense? Because sometimes it does. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> so one of the ways I like to talk about this is a, a critique of the ecosystem services paradigm a couple of ten, 10 years ago, again, in the magazine Nature, was that Valuing nature because of the ecosystem services it provides is like valuing the Sistine Chapel because it keeps rain out of the church. And most people would say that's not, why the eco that's not why the Sistine Chapel is valuable. It's not because it protects the church floor from getting wet. And that when we think about ecosystem services, that we're doing the same thing. So m what I think this is such a good example is that to me, that's, this is the power of cultural ecosystem services. Is it says actually no, the reason we value this is because it's a sub substantial, amazing part of our heritage because it's beautiful, because it has a spiritual value, because it connects us to who we are and where we've been. So this is why I think cultural services can have a role to play. So the goal of my work is to understand and characterize these non-material benefits <coughs> to bring them more fully into decision making in equitable ways. So these are the fields that have informed my work in cultural services for the past five years or so. And the point here is not necessarily the specific fields, but that there are a lot of them, and that there are a lot of people who are studying these values. It's not new to study these kinds of relationships. What is new, relatively, is to try to bring them into a decision-making framework. So that's why this is, my, this is my goal, is to understand how do we bring them into decision-making, because I think that's the, the angle that the ecosystem services approach is adding to all of these fields that have been doing this for a while. So today, the, for the next, half of the talk, I'm gonna talk about a couple big ideas in cultural services. Cognitive benefits and sociocultural benefits, which are sort of two sides of the coin of how to think about non-material benefits. A new idea that I was part of a group that proposed this idea of relational values. And then two projects that I'm working on that are reviewing the literature in this realm. So first, a little bit about cognitive benefits. <clears throat> so this work has gotten a lot of press recently, you may have seen it. Um, and I'm gonna give you just one example because there are over 100 cool studies that have awesome results. So here's one of them. So in this study, it's an experimental study where they brought people in, had them do, do an activity for 30 minutes in this room or this room with the plants removed. So that was the only condition that changed, right? The plants are either there or they, they're not. And the two outcome variables that they looked at were attention to relationships and community versus attention to fame and wealth. So other focused versus individually focused values and then a generosity task where people were able to donate $5 or not. They found that being next to four plants for a half an hour increased both your caring and attention to others and how generous you were. So to me, this is a pretty remarkable result. That's pretty, pretty remarkable change just from being around four plants for a while. So this is far from unique, <laughs> and there's this explosion of work on the psychological and cognitive benefits of nature defined in many different ways, which I'll talk about in a second. But time in nature has been associated with more generosity, as we just saw, less stress, being happier, less brooding, being more creative, being less violent, greater likelihood of staying at your job, recovering more quickly from surgery, having better memory and recall, and do higher performance on many, many types of cognitive tests. This has been repeated in many ways that it just basically makes us a little bit sharper to be around nature. And so this is an example. It's been covered in National Geographic, in The Atlantic, Lots of attention to this psychological, where I'm gonna say cognitive and psychological benefits 
information. So the research on this now, what, what are we asking now? The big thing is mechanisms. So we're observing this phenomena a lot. Now we want to know what, what is it about nature, even a picture of nature, that has an effect on us. So one idea is this decrease in rumination, which is that it gets us outside of our own brain, gets us outside of our repetitive thoughts. And another is about the different kinds of brain activity associated with being, for instance, looking at our phones and screens versus looking outside and how that varies. And another concept that I think is really important <coughs> here, have any of you seen this acronym with respect to psychological research? So it stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. <laughs> and the point of this is psychologists saying all of this work, these hundreds of studies showing all of these really amazing connections between nature and people are all done on people that are weird in a global sense, right? Because we, the people in this room who are, it, who are fall into all of those categories are, because our country is that way, uh, are not the norm globally. And so there's this new wave of research saying, well, what, what if we work in other places where, and we do these studies, so there's a little bit of work going on in, in Japan, or there's quite a bit in Japan, so take away the W. But generally, this is only being done with a subset of the human population. So I think this is a really interesting new area, getting onto that ethical component of whose voices are we looking at and who are we paying attention to. So a little bit about sociocultural benefits. This is the area that I study more <coughs> focus. I think that the psychological and sociocultural are very, very connected. So I really follow that other work, but I don't do that experimental work or haven't yet done that kind of work yet. So I work on the cult sociocultural benefits. And I'm going to give you a couple of, couple of results from some work that I've done. So the first, about identity and Hawaiian forests. So I did, oh, I did surveys, surveys and interviews related to people's interactions with and relationships to the forest in Hawaii. So I'm going to show you some results from both the survey and the interviews, this triangulation, me triangulation method of using quantitative and qualitative work. So first in the survey, Native Hawaiians rated the statement, I identify with the Hawaiian forest more strong, higher than those of other ethnicities. And this work was corroborated by the qualitative work that I did. So that this idea of identity resonated more often and more deeply with interviews who had lived in the islands for their entire lives. And what I found in the data were three different kinds of identity relationships that were <coughs> pretty closely related to length of residence. So what were they? So the first relationship was a very tight connection between the ecosystem and identity. So this, a couple of examples of this would be, I'll let you read this quote. It's a very strong relationship. Made me who I am, has made my identity. So it's just very explicit that that person is very connected with the ecosystem. Similarly, Hawaiians without land cannot be Hawaiians. I can't imagine being who I am without having a connection to the land. So a very strong sense of overlap. Another group of people had that same overlap, but it was sort of mediated through practices. So it was mediated through things that they did in an ecosystem. So here's an example of that. So this is the practices and the interaction. So in this case, there was a really tight relationship, but it was mediated through what that person did. And then a second group of interviewees had a very different relationship. So they talked about close connections between the ecosystem and the practices that they did in that ecosystem, but they saw their identity as very separate. So they would talk about, well, yes, I go hiking in the forest, but that's not really about who I am. That's just me hiking in the forest. So here is a pretty striking example of that. I don't really feel that identity is necessarily tied too much to places. So the reason I share these three different relationships is that hopefully it's striking how Different people looking at exactly the same ecosystem have entirely different relationships with it. So that point of whose voices becomes really important when you look at that incredible heterogeneity of how people are relating, even with the same service and the same place. There's a huge variety in what people are experiencing. So I use this as an example of the importance of paying attention to the diversity <coughs> that we're seeing. And the next piece of work that I will discuss was just published. And it was combined with some, another researcher's work in an adjacent ecosystem in Hawaii. So coming out of the forest, it was in a forest and, and in an agricultural system. And it emerged from both of our empirical work. And we 
suggest three new cultural services, so to add to that list that I showed you at the beginning, um, uh, that, are, that aren't captured by the exi these existing lists. And hopefully these are things that, that resonate with you. So the first is this idea of ingenuity. This is ecosystems aid in developing innovative ideas, approaches, or practices. So if you're familiar with the concept of biomimicry, that it's very related. This hasn't been discussed in the ecosystem services field at all. So as one example, wires don't break in storms. This is from an interviewee. Wires don't break in storms because we install them to run the same way a vine grows. So people seeing engineering solutions or, or infrastructural solutions based on what nature is doing. Another example, somebody said, nature's probably where we get all our great ideas from. The second category that we added, suggested, was life teaching. And this was ecosystems providing opportunities for learning life lessons, personal values. So nature as a teacher. This is very common in indigenous, uh, indigenous societies around the world, so we found in literature review, but it's not talked about in the ecosystem services paradigm. So this is a, a picture of Native Hawaiian ceremony. This is a, a, a plant that's very sacred to hula practitioners for what it represents. So this is an example of this plant is a teacher. That's the way that Hawaiians would interpret this. This plant is teaching them how to be careful, how to be conscious, how to ask permission, that kind of thing. So a couple examples of what people said. Don't get cocky if you do. Guaranteed the land gonna humble you. So this idea of, light, of, of nature teaching you lessons and virtues that are helpful for life. Tenacity, so nature's tenacious, tenacious, that teaches me I have to be. And then this quote by a hula track practitioner that it teaches us so many lessons. Humility, non-attachment, reverence, respect. So deep and multi-layered, and that's why we need the forest as an important teaching tool. So that was another category that we saw so much in our data, so we suggested it should be included and, re and, and investigated in future research. The last one we suggested adding was perspectives, that ecosystems help people to gain a sense of their place in the world, to see where they fit. This is where you say, gosh, when I went up to that top of that mountain or I went to the, to the shore, I, got, I, I just got some perspective, right? So this is an over 300-year-old tree that people often mention getting perspective from. So this, I'll let you read this quote really quickly. So this is about a lot of the, the comments about this were related to understanding where, where you fit with respect to the rest of the world. And I think what's important about this quote is I'm enhanced even though I'm minimized. So this person is saying, I, my well-being is increased. I feel more complete, I feel more fulfilled, even though I'm realizing that where I fit, and that's not necessarily at the top of the hierarchy, but it creates in me a sense of belonging and a sense of humility. Okay, so what comes next here? So an obvious next step um, is, to, is to explore the, the details of these phenomena. So we're, we're seeing these phenomena, but we don't, we don't have an idea of how big, change, how big changes are, how big these effects are. Time scale is very big, so at what, how long do you have to be exposed to these things to gain, to ga to gain these benefits? Um, and then this idea of how much nature relates to this idea of mechanism, what kind of nature? So in all of these senses, like what, what do you have to see? To gain that sense of perspective, one author, a philosopher wrote about it, looking at a dragonfly, just a dragonfly. So she was in an urban area, she saw a dragonfly, very, very small, right? So does it matter? what kind of nature you're interacting with. Do you have to be on a mountaintop or can you be looking at a bug in your living room? And then, then this question of, of just what's going on. Why is this nature, how is nature different than other things that may stimulate us and what does this look like? And then with the, um, yes, with, with the three that I just suggested, so the ingenuity, life teaching, and perspective, that we need more ways of measuring this. So, so really where that ends is we've observed this phenomena and this is sort of the way research progresses, right? We, in qualitative and exploratory work, observed that this was really important to a lot of people. It was bubbling up in a lot of ways, but we don't really know how to characterize it because we weren't looking for it when we started. So now we're thinking about how could we measure these things? How could we incorporate those ideas into studies and make sure that we're now aware of not only those three we added, but all of the different cultural ecosystem services. I wanna mention quickly this idea of relational values, which again, presented with a couple of colleagues um, in last year. And this idea is, discusses a way to more accurately represent what people care about. 
So it's a response to the unidirectional service metaphor. So it's this idea that there's a lot of resistance to this idea that the way we should represent value is that ecosystems are over here producing some service and people are over here just receiving sort of passively this service that ecosystems are producing. But that one way relationship doesn't make sense. That actually what we need to be thinking about is that we interact. So a spiritual service, for instance, isn't about the ecosystem producing something. It's about a relationship that you have with an ecosystem. So I just want to throw that out there as another area of research that we're moving into. It also is an alternative to the intrinsic versus instrumental value debate that has characterized conservation since its inception. So I'll just go over one chart from this paper. So the intrinsic and instrumental value debate is that nature is, if you have an intrinsic lens, is valuable just because of itself. It has a moral value. It just deserves to exist on its own. Instrumental value is saying, is the ecosystem services paradigm. It's saying we're going to characterize value by the way it benefits people. And this is where we're, that we're talking about, right? But you can see why with cultural services, it gets a little tricky. Because often the reason we value something is because we feel morally obligated to preserve it, because we feel a moral connection to it. So this idea of relational value says, let's think about that as double-ended arrows. And that's the big difference, right? So this is not about a one-way flow of benefits. It's about the kind of relationships that we have. So we're doing some work to try to figure out, again, how do we measure these? How do we talk about these in a way that, way that brings them into decision making? So for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about two projects that I'm currently working on, and then I'll be really eager to open it up for questions. So these are two, uh, two um, <coughs> ongoing projects. The first is connecting to decision making. And the goal of this project is to characterize how cultural services research has connected with decision making. So in this case, I'm looking at the peer-reviewed research on cultural services, about 120 papers. And like much of my work, I'm sort of approaching it with both a qualitative and a quantitative lens. And so in this paper, I'm focusing on some stories of when cultural services have been connected to decision making, and then also some numbers. So looking at both quantitative work that's been done to characterize these services and laying out who's doing what, how many people are doing what kinds of methods, what are they doing, that kind of thing. So I'm going to tell you a very brief story. This is from one of the papers that I have come across. So this is a river in Jakarta, Indonesia. As you can see, people live along the river, they work along the river, their lives are pretty connected with it. But the river floods quite often, causing a great deal of damage to the people who live near it. So the city has a solution in mind to channelize the river, to concretize it, to treat it as an infrastructure problem, an engineering problem. So some researchers from Conservation International, large international NGO, came in and said, well, what if we think about the river in another way? What if we think about it as an ecological system, and we think about an ecological solution to the flooding. <clears throat> so we think about this floodplain type approach versus a channelized approach. And what they did was they went into this community, developed a lot of relationships, and did a willingness to pay study to ask people, would you be willing to pay for one or the other of these scenarios? Would you prefer one over the other? And even though these people were in a, a, fair, a great deal of poverty, most of them, they came, <coughs> on average, they they stated that they would be willing to pay a small amount. And this was made pr pretty realistic. It was added to a weekly charge that they already pay for trash removal and other community amenities. So they said, what if we added a little bit to that? So they, they stated that they would be willing to add a small amount to that weekly charge in order to have the green version, the one that was on the left. And when, when the researcher said, OK, now we have a number, but we're going to do some more work to look at why you're saying that and what exactly you value. So they did a series of focus groups, a choice experiment, and interviews, all designed to dig into that number and say, what is it that you value in particular and why? And the short answer to the results of all three of these methods was cultural ecosystem services. So that's what they cared about. They cared about access. They cared about their kids playing. They cared about being able to be in the greenery and to experience it. So this, this decision is still ongoing, and the cultural services work, because of the work that they did, it's on the decision-making table as part of the discussion of what should happen. So I think this is a really interesting, specific example of how these services can be brought into the decision-making sphere. So quickly, some numbers. <coughs> so I'm going to show you a graph on the y-axis, the number of articles that are falling into each category, and the x-axis, the connection between research and decision-making that's discussed in that article. So Roughly a quarter of the articles that I have looked at say absolutely nothing about decision making. 
which is pretty interesting to me since the concept of ecosystem services is a very applied concept that kind of exists for decision making. So that's interesting. About half of them say, well, this could be relevant. So this in the abstract, generally, this data could inform some decision making process somewhere. So that's, that's half of the articles. A small handful proclaim that we need to include these values. It's very important to include them, but don't talk about any specifics. A few, again, general principles of how they work, but don't get specific. And only about 10% actually give an example. They actually relate to a specific decision, like the one I just gave. So scale isn't, isn't, this doesn't mean necessarily they're small scale, like the one I just gave, which is relatively small scale. There are also specific decision articles that relate to global processes and how we're going to incorporate cultural services into global processes. But the question now that I'm looking into is, what's going on with this? So, so what are people saying about, <coughs> about cultural services that in these different categories? What characterizes these studies that fall into these different categories? How can we learn how to make this work more relevant to decision making based on what people have said and done? So for instance, one thing I'm looking at is the methods that are used in each of these different categories. And there's not a huge pattern with different methods, but one thing I do want to point out with the, in this current color scheme is the yellow-orange color, monetization. <clears throat> Just going back to the beginning of the talk, when I talked about cultural services and, and ecosystem services and money, you'll see a pretty small proportion of these studies are monetizing. So actually, most of the studies, the lion's shares of studies on cultural ecosystem services are not putting a dollar value on things. They're representing value in a lot of different ways. So when we ask the question, how do you measure that? That's what this paper is looking at. And the answer is people measure, measure that in lots of different ways. There's a great diversity of measurement techniques. And I, that's what I'm digging into and looking more into, because I think it's very interesting. One note I want to make before going to my last point is about the power of deliberation. So this is an idea that's been around for a long time, but it's, it's having some new applications right now. It's pretty popular in the ecosystem services field. There was just a special issue of the journal Ecosystem Services focus on shared values and deliberative decision making. And my personal reason I'm focusing on this is my personal experience working on these values in a number of different places shows me how relevant this can be. So especially these values are very hard to understand. There's something that that are hard to even bring to sort of fruition in your brain to put a, a name to in your brain. They're even harder to articulate in words. And so this idea of having a chance and a, a safe space to have that discussion as a community, whatever that community is, whatever size that community is, that's a really big conversation that's being had in the research world right now because that's often what we need as people to understand, to truly understand what we want and what's valuable to us. So this is something, this is a new area of research that I'm really excited about. And my final thought on this sort of, this idea of how do you measure that is the need for creativity. So I've given you a couple of examples. There are many others. So people are using Flickr photos to indicate where people have gone to recreate. They're using that to measure things. People are using lots of different creative mechanisms for trying to get at what, what do these values mean to people. And I would just argue we need to continue being creative, continue looking at other sort of other realms, perhaps unexpected arms of of research and of practice to see how we can represent these values, get them onto the table so that they're part of the discussion in a rigorous way. And I want to share as one example of that from this, the final, is, the final, um, final editorial in the Ecosystem Services special issue was this kind of directive for, <clears throat> for how to move forward. This is kind of a run-on sentence, but I'll break it down. So basically it's saying, what other institutions in our society have used deliberation and have interesting models for how we can bring deliberation into our decision-making processes? We should look at, they're saying, for instance, faith communities to, to, to incorporate how they're doing, having these discussions to try to bring that into how we're talking about ecosystem services. So this is an example of that creativity that I think is really important. Okay. And the last thing I'll talk about, very much a segue from that idea of deliberation, is that the idea that cultural services are dynamic. So an underlying message of the fact that deliberation makes a difference is that people don't come into that deliberation room with precisely their hard, hard and fast decision about what they value or what their preferences are. They don't come in with that sort of 
a stake driven in the ground as to what they think. We develop our preferences based on social interaction in many cases. And this, so this idea that cultural services are dynamic, I think is a really important idea that people aren't talking very much about. So you can notice that maybe your valuation of an ecosystem service, of, of an ecosystem, has changed throughout your life. As you get older, as your life changes, as you change your life stage, it changes. How you, how you relate to an ecosystem changes, and particularly what you learn and what you know. That can change dramatically how you relate. So this is an idea that I'm really interested in, and so that's what I'm looking at. So this idea that preferences and values change, we're not going to get into the differences between values and preferences. Many fields discuss this change. So just very briefly, I mentioned in psychology the process of having to articulate something can lead to change. In economics, this idea is called constructed preferences, that we have to talk with people to construct how to phrase our preferences in political science, deliberative democracy, and the entire field of education are all based on the ideas that our values and preferences are dynamic. So I think cultural services just need to address that. So that's where this research is, is uh, sitting, is at that kind of intersection. So this idea, I also study environmental education, as you heard in my introduction. So I'm looking now at what's the overlap between these two fields, and I'm just starting on this work. The question is, <clears throat> does environmental education ever try to develop or increase access to cultural services? So can we think about what environmental ed is doing in, in, in cultural services frame? And so I've again looked at, I looked at the peer-reviewed literature on this, and I've coded outcomes with respect to those that relate to cultural ecosystem services. And again, the question is, is environmental education trying to foster any of these values? And is it successful in doing so? Same kind of graph that you saw before. So we have articles on the y-axis and the categories of the outcomes. So what is environmental education trying to change on the x-axis? And so you see that a number of these are quite related to, to cultural ecosystem services. So particularly identity, connectedness to nature, <coughs> community and social capital. So social connection is a cultural service. So there's, there's some overlap where, where environmental ed is trying to impact our cultural services. I'll give you just a couple of examples of ways that these have been measured. So aesthetic appreciation, these are some items that have been measured, used to measure that. I, I love the soft rustling of leaves. I enjoy sitting at the edge of a pond watching dragonflies. Apparently dragonflies are big in this talk. And, um, and an identity, how would you describe an environmentalist? Would you describe yourself as an environmentalist before this environmental ed experience after? and what was meaningful to you about your trip. So my point, part of where I'm going with this article is, why, so why does this matter? Why is this connection important? One is that <coughs> cultural services are an important motor fader for conservation. So this is often discussed in the cultural services world. And they're impacted by experience. They change. So I think we need to be talking about that. And environmental ed is a field that's already talking about that. It's what it's trying to do. It's trying to change those services trying to motivate people to mobilize those services, essentially, to motivate people to care about conservation. And importantly, I think that the environmental education field could provide some of those creative ideas about how to measure. So what I said, we need to be creative, we need to be looking at other fields. I think environmental ed is one field that's been doing that and might provide some creative ideas. So <clears throat> the last thing I will say is just to, to sort of bring it home that I mentioned how important the ethical implications of this are. I do a lot of community-based work, and uh, another part of that ethical implication is the importance of bringing ba work back to the people with whom I've done that work. So one of the things I'm most proud of with my dissertation um, was working with local partners to create a hula show, <coughs> so this was in Hawaii, to present some of those results <coughs> Excuse me, that you saw um, to a sort of packed house of 300 people um, that was on a Saturday night, used local artwork in advertising it. And, and I want to so mention, by, the, by talking about this, by educating people about what came out of their community, perhaps we're also doing some environmental education, right, and developing some cultural services. So there's a couple pictures from this show. So these were locally collected plants, collected in that very respectful way. The narration was using um, language from my work. And the final song that was written originally for the show also used the language of some of my interviewees and used some of the results from the quantitative work as well. So this is just really important to me to be able to sort of bring this back and have that conversation with the community. So I want to leave you with this question. This is really what I'm interested in. How do we incorporate something so difficult to measure but so important into our decision making? This is the question that motivates me. And the question of how do we measure that is wrapped up in there. So with that, I will leave you and be open to questions. <laughs>
Thank you.